Good afternoon. Thanks for having us. Uh, I'm Ryan McClusack. Here's my partner, Joe. He'll uh, give you a little background about him in just a second. But we, um, we started Motometrics, as Michael just said, um, very recently. It's kind of been a journey as well. Um, and we both started kind of from opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, I played college football, uh, have, uh, have seen the impact of concussions, have seen the impact of concussions on players when they return too soon, how their life is affected after the fact. Uh, Joe brings some science background to this. So together we kind of have a good mix um, of what is Motometrics. So we, um, we are actually the first and only company to use nonlinear analysis of posterior control to detect not only when a concussion has happened, but when the, the concussed person has returned to a normalized state. So what that means for everyone here is that if you have a concussion or known anyone who has, um, you know that feeling inside, you're just a little bit off, you're out of tune, you're not in sync. So we can take now that feeling you have on the inside and detect it on the outside with our analytics. Um, here's some other data that you guys might not know. Um, I think the most important one on here for us is as many as 40% of high school students, high school student athletes return prematurely to activity. So what that means to me is that there are tests currently in place and they're not sufficient. Um, the main reason for that being uh, concussion is a evolving process. Most people think you might take a hit, you have a concussion, um, and it kind of stops right there. It actually evolves over time, so your symptoms are going to change over the course of time, and we have the technology to, to track that over the course of days, hours, weeks, and let you know when you've returned to your normalized state. Uh, so Joe's going to talk a little bit about the science, get into the details. I'm going to follow up with the business, what the market looks like, how we plan to enter that market. So um, there are many products on the market that, that attempt to screen concussions right now. And generally, they can be broadly broken into a couple categories. We're breaking here things that focus on cognitive capability or risk of impact. And so multiple products either do cognitive assessments to see if you are functioning mentally to determine if you've suffered a concussion, or actually look if you've been hit very hard to see if you've suffered a concussion. Or you can have complicated imaging associated with it. And all those we view as complementary. They are either after the fact analytics that really give uh, anatomical cues as to whether or not there's damage, or there are tests that are sort of secondary to the metrics that we're looking at. Really what we're looking at is biomechanics and specifically postural stability. So there is this unconscious constant correction every human being makes when they stand on two feet. And that correction can be detected with the appropriate instruments. In this case, we're utilizing something called a force plate, which is basically a hypersensitive bath scale. And what it can do is assess your exact center of gravity at any given time. Now, that analysis basically provides a data stream that determines what someone's biorhythm is in their ability to stand up straight. Now, there are multiple products on the market that utilize this in whole or in part for concussion detection, but none of them are really utilizing it in a way that unlocks the power of this biorhythm. Specifically, uh, some of them actually do principally focus on postural stability, but they don't do it based on a standing test. They require multiple positions to be assumed or complicated uh, sort of routines for the patient to utilize. Those are, are utilizing relatively simple mathematics, and I'll get into that in a minute. Alternatively, they can utilize uh, the same sort of force detection platform, but they also combine it with other analytics, which creates more data, but also some complications related to how to combine them. So this kind of gets to the heart of, of Motometrics, which is this uh, pleasant-looking gentleman, Dr. Nick Stergio. Nick Stergio is a researcher at the University of Nebraska Omaha. He is the director of the biomechanics facility there. He's actually the recipient of a brand new building, which I'm sure many of you have seen. His research is, is very cutting edge. But the important thing to keep in mind is he's not a concussion researcher. He is not focused principally on concussions. What he does is he evaluates biomechanics. He looks at the patterns that bodies make when they move. And the thing about human bodies is they move variably, but not chaotically. Every step a person makes is slightly different, but there are patterns in all of that difference that are common between them, a signature that goes along with it. Now, uh, most analyses that look at biomechanics, they don't look at complicated signatures like this. They look at just raw thresholds. How much did you move? Was it within a certain number? If it is, then that's a problem. Nick doesn't look at that. What he does is he looks at the overall variability itself. Is it healthy variability or is it unhealthy variability? And he utilizes nonlinear analysis for that. Nonlinear analysis essentially uh, allows him to focus principally on what does the overall signal look like, not what a particular threshold looks like. Now, 
when you're standing for concussion analysis, for example, there is a pattern with that. It is self-repeating and is recognizable, and that's when you're healthy. When you get a concussion, that pattern changes. And there's been a peer-reviewed study that Dr. Stergio published a number of years ago utilizing algorithms that was able to distinguish between healthy biorhythms when people didn't have concussions and when they did. And those patterns are actually applicable even beyond injury. These are unconscious corrections that you're making. And even if you have some injury in your ankle or your wrist, it is still that underlying rhythm that's sort of maintained. So this is what the company will do. This is what Motometrics does. This is the Moto screen. And it has a couple of, of components. So up on the right, on the top, there is a force plate. Uh, across from that is, a, is an Apple iPad, but it's really just a simple computer interface. And then down below is Dr. Stergio's new building, which we're using as a data center. And basically, what we would offer to a athlete is a screen at the start of the season to assess what a healthy biorhythm is. And then if there's a potential injury, there's an opportunity to reassess. Now, if that's reassessed, that's essentially mediated through a relatively simple interface that can be done with someone without a lot of training. Now, that interface then transmits it to a remote data center where proprietary algorithms analyze that biorhythm and see if it is different from the baseline. If it is, that person is screened for a concussion. Now, on top of that, that assessment can be repeated until that person comes back to a healthy biorhythm. Not only does Motometrics analyze when a person has a concussion, but they can determine when a person has recovered from it, which is absolutely essential. Now, in addition to being a very effective platform, we view this as a software as a service business model that is highly scalable. All you have to do is deploy the force plate and a simple computer analysis and some training to a center in which it can be analyzed. And I'll let Ryan speak more about that. Thanks, Joe. So we have um, what we feel is superior technology. Can you guys still hear me? Is this my car right? Um, and the, the analytics behind us. We wanted to look if the market was sizable enough where we could actually be a profitable business. Um, this is just some numbers. These are some numbers that really piqued my interest looking at it. Um, 24,000 high schools, 7 million high school athletes. Uh, 110 D1 football programs, just football alone, 110 programs. They spend on average $65 million a year on medical, uh, medical services. Another 171 Division II football programs. So you start to see the numbers, numbers and extrapolate out on what the actual size of this market could really be. So we feel like we can get there. We have some competitive advantage getting to it. Um, as Joe said, we have a centralized analytics center. So all the data comes to us and we can disperse answers back. Um, and we have uh, some retail oppor or some partner opportunities that really allow us to get into any market we want to very quickly. So when we're first going to start, we have two um, I'll call main sales markets. We have what we're going to call retail and then direct sales. Retail sales, we're, we're finding local partners um, to be the conduits to reach our end users, which are youth sports and high school sports. Uh, these conduits are going to be physical therapy units, sports medicine clinics. Um, they're going to have the device in-house. We're going to go through training. We can deploy those in multiple cities um, to, to reach a mass market. So youth sports, I think on the slide before it was uh, 7 million or something um, youth participants in football. Um, Group-based pricing, so we're going to go after the coaches of these sports. We're going to get volume discounts to, um, uh, for referrals to our retail centers. High school sports, multiple sport pricing, so you have football, wrestling, basketball, hockey. Uh, the more sports you sign up, the, the lower price you're going to have. The direct sales model, these are going to be sales directly to universities and professional sports teams. Um, they are going to require the hardware and software on site. The analytics still comes back to us to do the analysis on, but we're going to provide the service and support. They're going to want to have more control. They're going to want to retest more often. They want to be um, on the forefront of when the concussion is actually done so they can get their players back on the field as soon as possible. Um, based on the market size we saw before, these are very um, generous revenue predictions for the next three years based uh, primarily on the youth sports and the high school sports market with some of the direct sales sprinkled in there. Um, so you can see uh, we have a, a pretty substantial revenue growth based on very conservative estimates. Um, so what we have next, we have about three stages of development left. We have to complete the build out of the user friendly interface. Um, so, you know, a user friendly application on a mobile type device. Um, we have to retest the existing data that we already have and finalize our contracts with retail partners. And then obviously get this into select test markets and see how the strategy works. Uh, any questions? Mr. Taylor.
Yeah, that's actually a really good question. One of the advantages of a software as a service model is there's no opportunity to reverse engineer the software to essentially improve the algorithm. In addition to that, it allows for constant improvement for the algorithm, which is why we want to keep Dr. Sturgeo very heavily involved. He is an expert. It, these algorithms aren't out of whole cloth. They're the application of known nonlinear analysis to biomechanics research, and that's been his bread and butter. I'm actually really intrigued. The original work he did on this, there's been substantial improvements, which makes me think that he's going to improve sensitivity and specificity by orders of magnitude when it's eventually launched. And just a quick follow-up. Uh, the data collection of a non-trivial thing, so if it went to the <coughs> hospitals or team sports, they would use the device, the data would go back to you, but the actual data collection they're doing is, is easily done or easily trained to do? So the trick is going to be getting the, the relatively simple interface that the person can utilize. Um, this is actually a key advantage we have over competitors, which require kind of this orchestrated routine of positions. The way the analysis is anticipated, the way the study was done, all they have to do is stand there and basically wait until the thing beeps. <laughs> and, and that's critical. And I think importantly, too, compared to other techniques, it's ungameable. You can't adjust your postural stability. It's entirely unconscious. And so it's a much more reliable indicator, especially in the moment when people are going to want a particular outcome. This is very neutral. It's very, uh, it's very technically driven. And it would take from the moment you start collecting data, there's like a 60 second beep. Yeah, the, it's a couple minutes now. We're we're getting the time down, but it's right now. Yeah. Yes, insurance-wise, we're actually still doing some work on whether you can insurance bill this, um, if that's kind of where you're headed. The, the regulatory um, sports medicine is not FDA regulated, and there's, um, there's some marketing efforts that have to be placed on how we, we hold ourselves out as a screen and not a diagnostic. Um, but we've had some, some legal guidance and some concussion and FDA consultants um, walk us through some of that, but we're still, it's ongoing. We have to make sure we get it right. That, in the long term, I think that's the goal, but right now you need a, a specific baseline before and after for the same individual. The way the study was done, it did require an initial baseline. The way the study was originally done will require a baseline, but it is conceivable with improved algorithms that will not be necessary. And a, bigger, a big enough data pool we can hopefully measure. Yes, sir. The second question is no, but go ahead and take the first. First question, yes. It was done at the University of North Carolina football team. Um, and to kind of build on that statement, no, they're not. And by having a biomechanical analysis for it, you're going to catch more. Um, you are looking at the entire interaction of the whole body, the nervous system, the central nervous system, the skeletal muscular system. I don't know if it's going to catch every concussion, but it's going to catch more concussions than the impact or another cognitive or brain scan. Anything else? Yes, sir. So the only the false positive question comes up a lot, and the critical thing to keep in mind: the biorhythm is generated based on postural stability correction, which is entirely non-conscious. So it is. It's understandable that if you have a football injury, my knee's bad, I'm standing funny, that's going to affect essentially that analysis. But keep in mind, this isn't a direct analysis. You're looking for a pattern. That pattern will still be present, even though your rhythm will look a little bit different. It's that underlying rhythm that's going to be there. You really have to have something that's damaging very deep inside your nervous system to really adjust that. It has to be a concussion. It certainly could be other things. You could have other neurological impairments, which you know, we can create a parade of horribles, but it's unlikely going to be an injured ankle. If you broke your leg and couldn't stand, you probably couldn't, you know, use the test, but that's kind of a... And, I th the, and part of it we, we weed out is if the baseline doesn't return to normal, then there's other tests that need to be obviously followed up on. Um, it's kind of a fail-safe for that. Uh, 
Um, that's, uh, yes and no. It, it's, every person is different, so every concussion is different. Um, so your, your baselines are going to look different. And I don't know the, maybe the, the medical or the correct term if I'm explaining this right, but um, the deviation from the baseline is going to have an impact on how, how bad the concussion could be. Um, but every person is going to be different in that case, too. It also measures duration which is probably, fun is probably going to be close. You're not going to put people back. If you have a bad concussion, it can, it's going to catch, the system would be more likely to catch that because you're not going to return to a healthy biorhythm or it won't put you on the field. The time to frame to get time. back to your baseline is going to be longer too. Sorry, we have another question. When you establish the initial baseline image, uh, do you, does the person have to be in any particular situation in terms of uh, rest, heart rate, No. They just have to basically be neurologically non-impaired. So they have to not have a concussion. And to kind of, just, I'll go for before, maybe if, if someone had that question coming up is, so say you have a, an injury in a game, the actual, the ideal time is not immediately after the concussion. It's probably going to be the next day. So you're not going to be, you know, in uniform, you're not going to have just competed in an athletic event, you're going to be, the next day you're going to come in and that's when we're going to retest you.